Ladies and gentlemen of the Vortex Nation, welcome to the first digital event, or excuse me, live event that we've had in two years. Today we're going to do a virtual hunter sight in. And you might be asking, why are we doing it virtually this year? Well, COVID-19. We usually hold the, uh, the event at the Edge facility here at Vortex uh, every fall, right before the, uh, the firearm season kicks off here in central Wisconsin. Uh, to adapt to that, we're going to do it digitally uh, and live here on, on Facebook to give you an idea of how to get set up and get ready to rock and roll to head into the woods this fall. Uh, so a couple things we're going to touch on today is mounting your rifle scope if you don't have it mounted already, bore sighting, actually zeroing, um, and really just make sure that everybody has a safe and successful hunting season and give you an additional resource that you can reference later. Uh, at the end of this, we are going to do a live Q&A, so if you've got questions on anything that we go over today in the event, uh, shout them out. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be ready to answer it. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to kick this off right away with how to mount a rifle scope. Um, we've got a couple rifles here today. Uh, picked this one strategically for a few reasons. We've got some interesting rings um, and a rifle that, that can't necessarily be bore sighted in the conventional sense. So we're going to attack this one and, and give you an idea of how to do this. Um, what we've got here in front of us is a Browning BAR. Uh, and this procedure would work for really any other kind of rifle too, but uh, like a Remington 7600 or a Browning BLR or a Marlin 336, whatever you've got. Um, a rifle that you can't necessarily bore sight through the back of the bolt, which we'll jump into in a little bit. Um, but we're going to touch on some basics here. Mounting your rifle scope. <clears throat> first things first, make sure that you've got the appropriate tools. Uh, a couple things that we use here at Vortex we find exceptionally handy are a set of levels. We like to use these from CTK Precision. Uh, a good screwdriver with the appropriate bits. Today we're going to be using a T15 Torx and a flat blade uh, standard screwdriver. Um, and I also have a 9 16 uh, combination wrench because we are going to be installing these in a set of uh, Leopold windage adjustable or standard rings and bases. Um, so first things first, weapon is clear. Uh, just for all you folks watching and wondering, and I'm actually going to take the scope off. We've just got it lightly mounted in place here. Uh, and we're going to just check the alignments of the front ring and the rear ring. This is a really interesting uh, scope mounting system. And it's actually a very practical scope mounting system. But we get a number of calls every year with folks that are running these. Um, just curious how to set them up and how to do it right. So first things first, we're going to make sure that the action screws are, or excuse me, the uh, base screws are tensioned to the receiver appropriately. On this, we can go to 25 inch pounds. And we will cam these over. These should be good and snug anyhow. And then we're going to loosen the rear windage adjustment drums on the back. Just to give us a little bit of leeway and a little bit of play. Now, with these rings, they're, they're very interesting in that the rear screw, will, rear screws rather, on the uh, ring assembly will move side to side, and they're going to move that ring left, right, and pivot at the front. Um, a consideration to make with any windage adjustable system like these or like the older Redfields is that the two rings are in alignment with each other. If you don't do that, the potential to crush the rifle scope is, is very real. Um, a 9 16 inch wrench will fit on these, and this front ring will pivot left or right. I believe that would be the correct terminology. And what we're going to do is just visually align them as best we can. And then we're going to set the rifle scope in place. You can also use a lapping bar to do this too. And what I want to see is good movement of this rifle scope in this cradle or in this saddle that's created by these two rings. We don't want any binding or pinching or anything like that. So that looks good. I'm going to just gently set the caps back on them. I'm not going to completely torque them yet because uh, we are going to start adjusting these base screws in the rear after a second here. An important thing to note, we want to keep the ring gaps on either side pretty equal. You don't have to get the feeler gauges out, but as equal as possible. All right. So these should be loose enough that I can move the rifle scope side to side so I can correct for any misalignment I have in there or can't, um, but not so you know loose that the whole thing flops around and falls out. I'm just going to touch these windage adjustment screws 
to either side to make sure that that rear ring is held in place. And we're going to jump into leveling this. Uh, so with this particular system, because it's a one-piece base, I have a nice flat surface to work with here to attach an action level to or a receiver level. This is going to make sure that the gun is level as a good base. And we'll just tilt that in there until we're on the bubble. And then I would also recommend taking the turret cap off of your rifle scope. Um, things like turret caps uh, or exterior features of a rifle scope don't necessarily have uh, solid bearing on, on like the levelness of the reticle. Uh, as this is a separate part made on a separate machine, um, it'll have different tolerances. So the closer you can get to the reticle, like the top of the turret underneath the cap, the higher degree of levelness that you can achieve. So we'll take, make sure that the action level is level. We'll set this one on the scope on top, and then I'm just going to turn the rifle scope until it is also level. And a pro tip, something like a T-handle wrench to provide a little tap to make sure everything gets level will get you up to speed a little bit quicker. Okay, we're there. Now on Vortex scopes and a lot of other scopes on the market too, um, ring torque is very critical. Um, one of the more common reasons we see rifle scopes come back to us for service is simply ring over torque. Uh, so consult your rifle scope owner's manual. I can tell you for every Vortex Optics rifle scope, 15 to 18 inch pounds is the perfect amount of torque to put on them. Uh, don't use any liquid thread locker uh, as it'll lubricate that thread and you'll end up with a wet torque which can misappropriate that torque value by quite a bit. A good ring at proper torque value should hold up even on high recoiling rifles. So again, we want to make sure that those ring gaps are kept pretty even. I'm going to back these out, tension one, loosen another, all while keeping an eye on my levels to make sure everything's good. And then I'm going to provide incremental torque on the ring screws. I don't want to go full tilt on one, full tilt on the other, but incremental ring torque uh, alternating between the various screws. Um, I get a lot of questions about whether or not we should alternate between the rings. And I, it, you can, just so long as you're not biasing one side more than the other, I think that's what's most important. I like to do a single ring first. It's a personal preference, it seems to work. And you can hear the torque wrench cam over there. That means that we are secure. I'll go to the back ring. And cam over and cam over. That part's done. We're mounted, we're leveled. Now let's bore sight. Now earlier I had touched on the fact that this is kind of an unconventional rifle and that you can't do a traditional bore sight. Um, anything with a closed receiver. Again, this Browning BAR, we've got a Browning BLR here, lever action rifle. Um, perhaps a slug gun if you're in a slug zone like a Remington 870 or an 1100. Um, you won't be able to look down the barrel or do a real bore sight. There's a couple of really clever devices though that can help save you time and money on the range, um, like bore sighting apparatuses. So I, I have two here. Um, these two are kind of my favorite uh, for doing this kind of thing. We've got a laser type bore sighter that actually goes in the muzzle. I'm not as big a fan of the cartridge type laser bore sighters. Uh, the ones that go in the muzzles, I, I really do quite like. Um, there's a variety of manufacturers out there. Check them out, good one. And then um, a collimator type bore sighter. So it also goes in the end of the muzzle using an expanding mandrel to fill that muzzle. And inside of this, uh, there's a grid. Uh, and we use that to align the reticle and, and uh, the rifle scope with the rifle's bore. Uh, this is pretty old tech. These have been around for a long time. Uh, very handy. Uh, they're not terribly expensive. Throw one in the range bag or on the tool bench. And it is a great, a great idea to help you save some time and money. So these will just slip into the end of the muzzle. Try to level them out as best you can. And then when you look through the rifle scope, you'll see your reticle correspondent to a grid on the, inside of, uh, on the inside of that device. So I'm looking now, and my elevation is pretty good. I'm going to lower it down about four minutes of angle. And on this system, I'm actually not going to use the windage adjustment on the rifle scope quite yet. Uh, the standard rings from Leopold and the, and the Redfield style windage adjustables 
allow you to make gross windage adjustments using the ring system. This is advantageous because we're not exhausting the amount of travel on the inside of the rifle scope. It's keeping your optic near its mechanical and optical center, which is gonna just mean better performance overall. Uh, so again, we talked about those windage adjustment screws on the back and how they work to pivot the rifle scope. And I need to move this rifle scope on this rifle for a right point of impact. So I'm gonna drive it from the right side to the left. So I've got these two windage adjustment screws touching the rings. I'm gonna loosen one up just a little bit on the left side, and then I'm gonna tension the one on the right, and it's gonna pivot the rear of the rifle scope towards me and the objective away. This will change my point of impact, or rather my uh, zero position, boresight position. I'm gonna check here, and I hit it right on the money. I bet I couldn't do that two times in a row. So I'm still a little loose on this side, so I'm just gonna bring that up to touch, and I'm gonna begin applying incremental torque to this as well, and make sure this is secure, and then I'm gonna to torque it to 25 inch-pounds. And again, just like the ring caps, we're gonna make sure that this is done incrementally so that we don't instill a bias anywhere. And that's it. We're leveled, we're mounted, we're bore sighted. It sounds like a daunting process if you've not done it a lot of times, but with the right tools, it really takes no time at all. And again, folks who are tuning in, remember we're gonna have a Q and A at the end of this, so when you're ready, shoot your questions on over. I'll answer them as best I can. Let's get right to shooting. All right, so one thing I want to touch on before we shoot here is rests. Rests are pretty important. There's a lot of them out there, um, and we have a couple of recommendations. Uh, any sturdy front rest and rear support bag is great. Uh, things that we want to avoid, though, are rests that capture the buttstock of the rifle or rests that clamp onto the rifle. Uh, at some point, we do want the rifle to recoil freely, uh, you as a shooter absorbing that recoil. And while some of those others are very convenient for mitigating recoil, they can wreak havoc on the zero process. They can actually affect the way that your rifle shoots. So I, I really like these sturdy front rests and a good rear bag. A good front bag is fine too. Uh, we've got a bunch of these here at the edge range, so that makes it really easy. Um, Jarvis, if you would, please send the targets down to the 50. Oh, wait, one thing I wanna to touch on real quick. We're gonna have two different styles of targets out here. We're gonna have a large bull that you saw on the left uh, with a very bold black center. And then we're gonna have a precision target for shooting groups. The large bull on the big black center is gonna provide us with a really, really nice and easy to see visual point while we're getting ready to do our boresight process. Um, I'm only gonna use that just to make sure that my rifle's aligned when we execute a conventional boresight. And then I'm gonna switch over to the precision target to actually shoot the groups. Uh, we're having a, a fun time with the target carriers here. This is cool. If you're in the area and you want to see the edge range, swing on in. This is quite a facility, so these will be up and running, ready to rock and roll. Okay, so we're going to talk about a conventional or a manual bore sight. Um, I don't know if manual is the right word, but a conventional bore sight anyway. Uh, so the term bore sight, we're literally going to sight down the bore. Uh, easiest execution of this is done on something like a bolt action rifle uh, or say an AR-15 where you can actually pull the bolt carrier group out of the receiver and look down the barrel. So I had that large bull target on the left side with the, the large black ring and all I'm going to do is using my rests to support the rifle and not influencing it by holding onto it or anything, I'm going to center that, that large black circle in the middle of my bore while I look through it. So without influencing the rifle again, that is now centered and good to go. From here, we're going to remove our turret caps and manipulate those so that we can get on target. The whole idea behind this process is just to keep you from shooting wildly at a target and not know where you're at and save you ammo and time.
All right. So what I'm looking for here is the black center of the bull target, much like this turret cap. And I actually want my reticle at about the six o'clock position on it, centered left to right, just a little low. And so I'll manipulate my turrets while looking through the scope to accomplish this. And make sure that you check your bore alignment while checking the rifle scope a few times just to make sure everything's squared up and centered. Okay, that's it. We'll give this a whirl, get the bolt back in the gun. I'm gonna leave the turret caps off in case I need to make any adjustments. Of course, eye pro, ear pro. And let's zero. One thing to note too, a common call that we get here at Vortex, when you're executing the boresight process and you're looking at the turrets and you're looking at the reticle, a common question that we get is why does my reticle move opposite the direction indicated on my turrets? Um, this is a big one. Uh, we have a lot of folks call in about this one and it's somewhat confusing uh, to explain, so bear with me. Your turret indication is going to give you an idea of, this is the target that we were using down there, by the way, folks, for those tuning in very bold black center target so that we have something easy to see and center in that barrel. Um, anyway, the, the turret is gonna manipulate the reticle. It's not gonna have any bearing on your, on your rifle's bullet, like how it's flying out there. It's just moving the reticle to align it with the, I, I guess the, the trajectory of the, uh, the cartridge and the projectile flying out. It has to move opposite so that it forces your muzzle um, the opposite direction. So if you have a bullet impact that's high uh, from where your aiming point is and you were to move your reticle, your crosshair up to it, um, that would force your muzzle low. So we want to make sure that we accomplish that. If it was to go the other way, if, if you had a bullet impact that was high and we were just the reticle lower, it would just force our muzzle lower. So bear in mind when you're doing this, your reticle movement will be opposite that the direction indicated on your turret. Don't be alarmed. So, without further ado, let's see how this bore sight went. Everybody have eyes and ears? Okay. And uh, I'm about, well, I can measure it with my reticle using my subtension values. I'm about five MOA high. This is another clever trick to help you save some ammo when you're doing this. Not all reticles, but some reticles will have features on them, what we call subtensions. And if you're familiar with them enough, like in this case, our dead hole BDC reticle, you can actually use those as a ruler so that you're not really guessing the amount of adjustment that you have to put in. So if I, place a subtension on my reticle at my aiming point, the center of my bullseye, and then find my impact on the target with the center of my reticle. If I bracket this, I can see that it's just a little above the second line in the dead hold BDC reticle, which I know to be four and a half MOA. So I'm gonna guess five, and I'm gonna make an adjustment down on my turret, which again will move my reticle the opposing direction, uh, of five MOA. And I'm gonna move right about three quarters of an MOA. Okay, let's try another shot.
here in my enthusiasm, I may have over-adjusted, which is not a big deal. We're still only two rounds into the process. Again, I'm going to bracket with my reticle. I'm going to see I should have gone about four and a half. So I'm going to go up. Just a bit and reconfirm. And while you can't see that on the target down there, I promise it's dead center. <laughs> so that was it. Three shots to zero off of a manual bore sight. Um, you shouldn't have to go through boxes and boxes of ammunition when you're shooting uh, to get your rifle sighted in. Um, so you'll notice we're, we're not on our 100 yard range. If you're familiar with the edge facility, we're actually on our 50. And a question that we get um, quite often is with respect to ballistics, like where is it advantageous to zero at 50, at 100 or otherwise? Um, and depending on your situation, depending on the cartridge or the caliber that you're shooting, uh, a 50 yard zero is not a terrible idea. In fact, I was just on an antelope hunt in Wyoming. I executed a 50 yard zero uh, before I went out there. Um, keep in mind, your trajectory is going to be moving up as we come out of the muzzle. We're going to intersect your sight line, at this case 50 yards, and we're still actually gonna be traveling up a little bit and it's gonna come back down. Um, so you're gonna have a redundant zero at a given yardage. Now, uh, with this particular rifle, I can assume it's probably gonna be around 200 yards or so, and using a ballistics calculator, we can figure that out. Um, a question just came in here. Uh, somebody asked, how come I didn't do a three round group? And, and this is a really good question. I actually probably should do a three round group to confirm my zero. I'm taking for granted that this zero was solid and I just fired a one round group. Um, I, I actually would recommend doing a three or even a five if you wish, uh, just to make sure that that zero was good, that your adjustment was good and that your rifle's repeatable. A few things to bear in mind though, if, uh, if you've got a rifle with a very light contour barrel or you're shooting a really fast cartridge, something like say 264 Win Mag or 26 Nosler, barrel heat can affect your point of impact um, and it'll instill mirage, which can also complicate your image. So a three round group, very safe bet. Um, so what other distances should you zero at too? Another great question uh, that we get quite a bit. Um, I think if you're hunting in the Midwest, uh, like up here in Wisconsin or over in Minnesota or Missouri or Iowa, uh, I try to match the zero with the intended range that we would be thinking we would shoot, you know, our, our targets or our deer or whatever we're hunting. Uh, so up here where we've got some tight cover, some ag lands, things like that, I, I would say a hundred yard zero is a very safe bet. When I travel out west uh, or when I talk to folks that are hunting in, in uh, like vast expanses, Wyoming, New Mexico, Arizona, Montana, pushing your zero out a little farther is not a terrible idea for a number of reasons. Uh, one, we're increasing what's called our maximum point blank range, meaning if we look at a rifle's given trajectory, if, if we push the zero out a little bit, anything inside of that zero distance, let's just say 200 yards, is more or less a hold on and, and fire solution um, without having to worry too much about compensating for distance. Uh, I really appreciate doing that. Most of the game I shoot is 300 yards or in when I'm in a Western state hunting with a rifle. And if I can push my maximum point blank range out a little bit, it's gonna just save me time um, anxiety, frustration when I'm trying to execute that shot. Uh, and it's really not going to goof you up too much on the short end. It's not so much a worry when, when we're talking about a target that would then appear at, say, 50 yards if you had a 200 yard zero. The offset's going to be really negligible. Uh, so, great question on where to zero, at what distance rather. Um, pick a zero distance based on your intended game species uh, or, or like what kind of shots you're going to encounter. I, I wouldn't recommend doing say a 300 yard zero if you're going to be hunting in you know, the, the northern woods of Wisconsin, you might have a 50 yard shot or a, a 25 yard shot. You might want to tone it down just a little bit. Um, so what if you don't have uh, access to the edge facility like we have? Where's a good place to shoot? Uh, check around your area. A lot of, a lot of state uh, uh, natural resources websites will list public shooting ranges that are open to use. And certainly there's a lot of gun clubs and a lot of uh, you know, municipalities and, and counties up here in the Midwest anyways. 
check them out, see if you can get a membership or see if they have an event like this hunter site and that you can go do. Um, public lands too, uh, depending on your state's laws, so check those first. A lot of public lands allow you to shoot recreationally on them. Um, you know, there's some great content out there. We did a big blog on, on uh, where to shoot public land shooting uh, and getting a hold of your state agencies for that. Check that out as well. Uh, for anybody in Wisconsin specifically, check out the Wisconsin DNR's website. Um, they've got a keyword that you can type into the search bar, just shoot, and it'll pull up a variety of uh, different places that you can shoot. Wherever you go, just be sure though, clean up the mess when you're done with it. Be safe, wear eye pro, wear ear pro. So we're gonna take uh, a little bit of time now to answer some live questions. I do encourage you, shoot them at me when you have them. I'm excited and eager to go. First one coming in right now from Nathan. Uh, he says, I normally like to level the receiver and use a plumb bob to align the reticle. How do I feel about this method? I think this is an exceptional method. Um, aligning with a plumb bob ensures that your reticle is as level as possible so long as you have the rifle level uh, to make sure that that thing is dead square. We're using gravity to level that radical. Uh, it's a great technique. It's really easy to do. Um, I like to probably use like a 50 yard plumb bob in my range bag when I'm, when I'm shooting on an outdoor facility. I actually use, uh, I believe it's called contractor string. It's like a fluorescent pink so I can pick it up. It's got a high contrast against what I'm looking at. Um, and I will do that. If, if my rifle is good and level on a rest like this or, or like the, the gun vise behind me, that works really slick. Great way to do it. Um, I think that does give you the highest degree of, of reticle levelness possible. Uh, great question, Nathan. Thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, Trenton asks, how much clearance is necessary between the objective lens of the rifle scope and the barrel and magnum calibers? Uh, and this doesn't necessarily um, differ from magnum, from non-magnum, from rimfire, or from a shotgun or a muzzleloader. You want adequate clearance. Um, you know, I like to say a minimum of probably a millimeter, millimeter and a half, uh, if you can get it. I think what, what's really notable though, or something to take into consideration is actually your comb height relative to your eyepiece. Um, a lot of sporting rifles, especially in the American market, have very low combs relative to the receiver heights. Um, and for me personally, a lot of rifles I find actually a little bit difficult to get behind. Uh, so some of my guns I'll have raised cheek pieces or I run the lowest scope rings possible just to get behind the rifle and get comfortable and get into a good eye box position. Uh, eye box would refer to when you get behind the rifle scope, the optimal point in which you have a full field of view, unobscured, unobstructed, um, with a natural cheek weld. I don't wanna have to bury my face into the comb of the stock and I don't wanna have to periscope up. Speaking specifically to magnum calibers, those that have a lot of recoil, if you have to lift your head up off the stock, you're losing a point of support uh, necessary to mitigate recoil properly. That rifle is going to come up and it's going to kind of bite you in the face and, and it makes shooting rather unpleasant uh, if you don't have a muzzle break especially. So try to match your, your ring height to clear your objective to clear any features like bolt throw. Now this Browning A bolt here, they've got a very you know, low bolt throw. Um, if you've got a rifle like a Remington 700 or a Mauser type action like a Model 70 or a Savage Model 10, they have a little bit of a taller bolt throw. You actually have to be cognizant then of the eyepiece clearing the bolt as well. Uh, so match that ring height, not only to clear the objective, the bolt throw, but also to have a good cheek weld. Um, if, if you can't, Auxiliary cheek pieces are available on the market. Um, they're generally very inexpensive. They just slip right over the stock and give you, you know, a, a potentially adjustable little boost on the comb height there. Another question here from Eric Collins. Uh, AR-15s, 25 yard zero, 100 yard zero, 36 yard zero. Eric went 36. Um, what are my thoughts on this? Uh, again, we're, we're trying to match the, the zero distance with the application or with the target intended. Um, with a little bit of, of research using a ballistics calculator like our LRBC or like Hornady's 4DOT that they have on their website, both free, you can really see what your trajectory does downrange. Finding that redundant zero can be extremely useful, especially if you're limited on space, time, and ammo. Um, so like I said earlier, I, I had done a 50 yard zero prior to leaving on my antelope hunt and partially because I was short on time uh, and it was just 
a little bit easier for me to shoot a good group at a closer distance. Um, hopping into the ballistics calculator, I then went ahead and looked at that redundant or that redundant zero. I followed that that trajectory that had been created uh, for me in the calculator, and I found that my redundant zero in that particular rifle was right about 180 yards. So really close to where I like to have my rifles zero anyway. Uh, so again, match your zero distance with your application, with your cartridge. Uh, and with your intended target distance. I don't think there's a wrong answer. Um, Eric also asks, level ground zeroing, how important is this? Uh, and that is a really good question. As we increase or de decrease uh, like angle from the shooting position to the target and then increase distance, it can complicate things. You get kind of a different zero, um, or, or I should say you get a little bit of a different uh, consideration into your trajectory. You would have you know, your line of sight, and then you would have that horizontal component uh, built in with that angle there. Uh, and it, and it kind of can complicate that zero process. If I could make a recommendation, try to zero as level as possible to get a true zero. Um, if you have to do it uphill or if you have to do it downhill, consider using a rangefinder that does have angle compensation. Um, review both. You'll notice that in an angle compensating mode, you're going to generally get a different yardage than you would in a uh, like a line of sight or a straight on, um, you know, the actual distance between you and your target mode. Uh, so try to be level if at all possible. Um, I've got another question here. So is a collimator a good method of bore sighting? Uh, and I think yes, I think that is a good method of bore sighting. So the the device that I was using earlier was a collimator type bore sighter. Uh, it works great. I think that's a great way to go. Uh, great question here from Sam Wilson. What Caldwell rests are these exactly? So we use a variety of the rear bags. Um, we use the small bags, the intermediate bags, and the large bags. I believe this rest, this front rest, is called the rock rest. Uh, what makes one better than the other? They, they do have varying degrees of these. Um, some are like very simplistic. They, they lack a lot of adjustability or they might be made of a polymer and they're going to be a little bit lighter weight. We settled on these for their weight, their rigidity, and their adjustability. Uh, so I can pan and tilt, well I can't tilt, excuse me, but I can pan the head up here, um, and then I can also raise and lower it, and then they have these neat screw down feet that actually have little spikes on them that kind of dig into the tables, which I think that the range guys really like, um, to provide like a really firm rest. And so these things are absolutely rock solid on them. We've shot 50 BMGs on them, um, they're extremely repeatable. They're quite heavy. They weigh probably 15 pounds, maybe. Um, so they do give you a really, really sturdy front rest. I actually prefer a slightly smaller rear bag, um, if I had my, my preference. Uh, something not obtrusive that's going to interfere with how my shoulder um, corresponds with the buttstock of the rifle or get in the way of my, my uh, dominant hand or my trigger hand. Um, I like a bag that isn't completely filled either. I like one that's got a little bit of give to it. Uh, by squeezing the rear bag, it does a couple of things for me. One, I can raise and lower the muzzle of my rifle just by applying or lessening my grip on the bag. If I squeeze the bag, the muzzle will, or the, the stock will come up a little bit, the muzzle will drop. If I loosen my grip on the bag, um, the, the comb will drop and the muzzle will come up. I also uh, say that that has a little bit of a twitch factor mitigation for me too. So I, I do a lot of shooting, I kind of have a flinch. And if I'm really trying to hone in on a good, a good group, um, mitigating that flinch can be difficult. I've found that using a bag that's somewhat malleable uh, or just something to grab onto uh, as kind of a skull component focuses that energy that normally would manifest as a flinch into the bag and I don't have as many problems. So a, a sturdy rear bag, I like the V-notch type bags, something with a looser fill, not a total tight fill. Uh, so that was a really good question. Uh, good question here from Noah. What's good to clean my optics lens with? Uh, we get that question a lot. Avoid abrasive detergents, anything that's got a, like a, a lot of chemical composition to it. Um, just warm water if you have a lot of debris or mud on there. Kind of irrigate that. These are you know environmentally sealed, so that's not a, a concern. I'm not telling you to throw it in the bathtub necessarily, but you can you can apply water to the lens, and that's okay too. Um, I carry pre-moistened lens wipes. There's a whole bunch of them out there. If you stop by your local pharmacy, you can usually find them where you can find the reading glasses as well. Um, they've just got like a, a very mild lens cleaner on there. It helps remove oil and debris and things like that. 
Um, any lens grade cloth is good too. Uh, I don't, don't take the Carhartt jacket and wipe that lens surface. While you're not going to necessarily etch the lens, uh, well, unless there's like sand or grit or rocks in there, uh, it's just, it's not, it's not really the best way to do that. Uh, a soft lens cloth included with every Vortex Optics rifle scope, uh, really great way to do that. Um, and a lens, lens pen. Um, they've got a little sponge on one side. It's, it's a similar material to what the lens cloths are made of. And then on the other side, they generally have like a horsehair or synthetic um, kind of a brush that you can move large bits of, of uh, you know, debris if you've got some grass seeds or sticks or dirt or whatever. Great way to do it. Um, Greg asks a question. Browning X-Bolt, 6.5 Creedmoor, whitetails and coyotes, scope suggestions. Uh, this is my favorite kind of question. Uh, so depending on where you're hunting and depending on how you're hunting, I, I would generally tell you to tend towards lower magnification as a whole. This is a totally personal preference. Um, and so if you call up to Vortex and you get any of the sales and tech guys, you, you may get a different answer. But my personal preference is a lower magnification scope of better optical quality um, for a couple of reasons. We're increasing the field of view of the rifle scope, which is really great for hunting coyotes and deer. Um, as they move through your landscape, you have a, a higher propensity to pick them up in your field of view. Um, two, as, as a function of a lower magnification, we're allowing more light to pass through the rifle scope and get to your eye. You're gonna have a brighter image. Um, and especially if you're hunting coyotes at low light or no light scenarios, like at nighttime, um, you, generally a lower magnification scope is gonna be the preference. This same scope here, the Viper HS 2.5 to 10, uh, is my favorite overall. Um, I've used them for coyotes, I've used them for whitetails, mule deer, and antelope. Um, match your scope with your intended purpose. If you've got questions about it further than that, give us a shout, we're happy to chat with our preferences. Uh, great question. Uh, Trenton asked, do you lock tight your base to the receiver if it's a two-piece system? Yes, you can. Uh, I think that a thread locking compound of some kind on the base screws, things that we don't intend to remove with any degree of frequency, is fine. Um, keep in mind that a lot of rifles from the factory out of the box and those in your gun safe may have oil in those threads. And a lot of the uh, like liquid thread locking compounds are affected by oil contamination. So before you do that, uh, simple rubbing alcohol, isopropyl that you get at the, uh, at the pharmacy, degrease those threads with that or you use like a, a gun scrubber or a similar uh, product like that to get those threads good and clean. Uh, apply a you know, conservative amount of Loctite, no need to go over the top because it can leak into your action, it can get on your bolt raceways and cause you problems later on. Um, set them up and let them cure for probably 24 hours before you go out shooting. Uh, another product that we really like here at Vortex is called VC3 Vibratite. Um, I often equate it to rubber cement for adults. Um, it's more of a like a tacky gel than it is a like an, uh, a liquid thread locker. Um, it's very serviceable. And even after repeated removals of a fastener from a threaded receptacle, it still maintains uh, kind of a, a, a semi-mechanical bond between that thread and that threaded receptacle and really keeps the, the fastener in place over a long period of, of time. We use that quite a bit. That's a neat product I'd recommend. Uh, another good question here from Brian, and excuse the beeping, we're not entirely positive what that is, about adjusting for eye relief. Uh, great question, Brian. Eye relief is very critical and something to keep into consideration when you're setting your rifle scope up. We didn't touch on this in the setup process, and, and forgive me for not doing so. We've got a great video on mounting your rifle scopes that you can check out. Um, when you're setting your rifle up, I would recommend turning the magnification on your rifle scope to the highest power possible, and then in a standing position as opposed to a seated position, Shoulder the rifle, I call it a shotgunner's pose, and move the optic fore and aft in the rings until you have a full field of view. Um, again, at the highest magnification, that's the best way to go with that one. Um, reasons for this, at lower magnifications, you're actually gonna have uh, kind of an exaggerated eye box and, and eye relief, and it's not actually gonna give you a, a realistic example or a realistic um, uh, you know, situation in terms of eye relief. When you turn your magnification up, it's going to diminish your eye relief as those uh, zoom cells take hold and the lenses go forward. And 
you're gonna end up in a kind of a sticky situation. So long story short, just make sure that you mount your rifle scope at the highest magnification. I recommend doing it from a standing position as opposed to a seated or a prone, uh, and you'll end up in a, in a good place. Uh, so great question. Uh, Ken, last question of the night, asks if there's any chance of a Bluetooth rangefinder scope combo. Um, that is a, a great question. I think with respect to technology curves, uh, we're seeing a lot of that on the marketplace. Um, nothing on the imminent event horizon, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't tell you that it's uh, it's coming up anytime soon. But I'll put a bug in the engineer's ears. Maybe they're watching this too. Uh, and that'll that'll wrap it up tonight. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for letting me shoot some guns today. If anybody has any follow up on this uh, or has more questions to ask, don't hesitate to give us a shout. We're happy to answer any of these. Um, you're going to find this video here on our Facebook page, of course, live right now. And then on YouTube, you can reference it later. Uh, give us a shout. Again, any questions, anytime, 1-800-4-VORTEX. Or shoot us an email, info at vortexoptics.com. This is what we do all day. We enjoy answering these questions. And again, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, it's been two years, and I hope to do these again soon. See ya.